preoperative physical exam. This is the most common type of physical exam you will do as a podiatrist, general physical exam. This is not a comprehensive physical exam that one does in, uh, if you were to come into the doctor and say, you know, I just want a checkup. This is basically for a preoperative physical exam. So where we start, Justin, you want to? There. So we start with biosciences. Okay. And what I like to do is uh, make sure that my hands are warm, which warm hands are my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and also that my stethoscope is somewhat warm because, you know, patients don't like cold steel on their bodies. And then I simply take his pulse. And usually at the time I'm taking his pulse and I just wait for 15 seconds and I notice that Justin's pulse is about uh, actually 72 beats per minute, which is normal. Normal pulse is between 60 and 100. I look at his breathing and he's breathing in about 10 per minute and that's fine. And then we go on to doing the blood pressure. And I put the cup on his arm and I, um, most of the time you're going to have a blood pressure cuff, a standing blood pressure cuff, so you don't have to ask the patient to uh, hold the uh, measure, you know, the sphygmomanometer air, um, measurement. But in this situation, he's going to have to hold it. And then what I'll do is keep his arm at the level of the right atrium. I don't keep it down. I don't ask him to hold it up. And I don't say to him, just hold it there. I hold it. So I don't want him stressed. Okay? And then I pump the cuff up until the uh, brachial pulse is obliterated, which it is right now. And that's to remove the escultatory gap, and we talked about that. And then I put the <coughs> diaphragm on my stethoscope on his brachial artery, and I let the cuff down very gently. And I get a blood pressure of 120 over 80, which is absolutely normal. <coughs> now, if I get a normal blood pressure in his arm, I don't usually take blood pressures in his other arm, okay? So that's the vital signs. Obviously, we would do temperature. And uh, the other vital signs are pain. And I assume you're not in any pain. We haven't had the quiz yet. Um, and um, uh, O2 saturation, if he's breathing normally and you see he's a young, healthy man, we don't necessarily do pulse oximetry on him. The next thing that I do is I look at his head. And I look at his hair for any uh, issues, you know, does he have lice, which he doesn't. Does he have any scars? Uh, patients who have craniotomy scars, the things that you get concerned about are have they had strokes in which they may have had a hemorrhagic stroke and maybe somebody uh, went into their cranium to suck the blood out. Okay, we call that evacuation of a hemor hemorrhage in the brain or blood in the brain. Or um, he may have had a craniotomy because he had head trauma. But as you can see, his, he has no, no issues. Um, then I do um, ears, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, and throat. And I have my um, ophthalmoscope. And uh, the, now remember, this instrument is not the same instrument that an ophthalmologist uses. So you're not going to be able to see much of anything when you do this um, except the fundi and the vessels. And the two diseases that we're looking for as podiatrists in the eyes are what? Hypertension, Hypertension and diabetes, exactly.
This is a representation of the fundus. At the 3 o'clock position, you see the optic disc, which is actually the optic nerve. It's avascular, therefore it appears white. The blood vessels include the larger vessels, which are the veins, and the smaller vessels, which are the arterioles. And the macula is approximately 9 o'clock, and inside it is a depressed area called the fovea. Uh, this area is also avascular, and it is uh, composed of cones. This is again a picture of a fundus with the optic disc at 3 o'clock and the macula at 9 o'clock. The next set of pictures are a representation of hypertensive retinopathy. The next set of pictures have to do with diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy can occur at any time after the onset of diagnosis of diabetes. Scleral findings may include conjunctival hemorrhages, indicative of endocarditis, or jaundice, indicative of hepatitis. So what I do is, even if, if he has glasses on, I ask him to take them off. If he has contacts, I don't. And I take my um, ophthalmoscope, and um, I look in his right eye with my right eye, um, because I don't want to look in his right eye with my left eye. Therefore, I'm kissing him, which is <laughs> not appropriate. <laughs> At this time, so I ask him. Obviously, we turn the lights off. He'd look out there. I'd ask him to look at a spot on the wall, and then I look in his eye with my. Actually, I can see his. I can see his fund eye really well, and I'm looking at his vessels, and I'm looking for the optic nerve, and then. I do the same thing on the other side, and this is unusual that I can actually see his fundi this well because it's a bright uh, um, room and his pupils should be constricted. Um, I then uh, I look at his sclera, and I want to make sure that the upper lid covers the iris. Okay, I don't want to see the white of the sclera above because that may indicate what? Hyperthyroidism, right? Remember, because his eyes would be bulging out. Um, 
I usually do external ocular movements at this point, and I ask him to keep his head still, follow my finger, up, down, okay, and his external ocular movements so good, so that's cranial nerves, uh, okay, we'll get to cranial, now some people do cranial nerves all at once, I tend to do them in a rather um, different fashion. I just, I'm checking his external ocular movements right now. Um, and then later when we get to neurologic, I'll finish the rest of his cranial nerves. And then I... Examination of the ears is done to make sure there are no foreign bodies in the external auditory canal and no evidence of infection in the external auditory canal, which is sometimes called otitis externa, or infection in the middle ear structures, sometimes called otitis media. This is a normal healthy eardrum showing the cone of light which is reflected by the light coming from your otoscope. I want to look in his ears and I've already cleaned the um, otoscopic um, um, uh, device with an alcohol swab. I did this earlier because I don't want to <laughs> use the same. And I pull his tragus back and I gently, gently look in his, in his uh, to, uh, ear. I look at the external canal. I don't see any uh, debris in there, wax, and I see a shining uh, light on his tympanic membrane. And then I do the same on the other side. Okay. And it's absolutely normal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Examination of the neck should reveal full range of motion of the neck. 
uh, as well as no evidence of lymphadenopathy, as well as no asymmetry or unusual masses in the thyroid gland. So um, then um, I uh, unfortunately did not bring a tongue depressor, but what I usually do is I take off the uh, tip of the otoscope and I ask him to open his mouth and stick his tongue out, say ah, uh -huh. good, and um, I, I look at his teeth, I look at his gingiva, I'm looking for any pigmentation in his mouth, I'm looking for any ulcers in his mouth and I'm uh, looking at his dentition. Um, with the tongue depressor, I'd also check his gag reflex, and that would tell me something about his glossopharyngeal cranial nerve. Um, the um, the uh, um, If he has very poor dentition, which sometimes you'll see in patients, the anesthesiologist should know about that because if they have to use an airway, uh, an oral airway, they could break a tooth. The next thing I do is go to his neck. I check his range of motion. Just move, move your neck. What? Yeah, okay, great, good. And um, then I uh, am gonna check his thyroid. And what I usually do is come behind the patient and I go just below the cricothyroid cartilage and I ask them to swallow, okay? and I actually cannot feel his thyroid. I'm looking for the size of his thyroid. I'm also looking for any nodules on his thyroid gland. And then I also verbal, ver visually look at, his, look at him swallow, and I look for any sign of fullness below his cricothyroid cartilage, and I don't see any. Okay. Now, also with the neck, I'm checking for lymph nodes, and I'm checking his submental, uh, his submandibular, and his scalene nodes over here, and they're perfectly okay. I also, at the same time, ask him to shrug his shoulders, and I check for any supraclavicular nodes, okay? And there is a thing called a Verkau's node. He should not have any lymph node swelling in his supraclavicular area. Um, if he does, that's abnormal. And I'm also, when he's uh, shrugging his shoulders, I believe I'm checking for the um, hypoglossal, is that correct? The hypoglossal? No, it's the, um, which one is it? It's the uh, <coughs> spinal accessory, spinal <coughs> accessory. Yeah, spinal accessory. Okay. Um, I also check for his axilla. Uh, at the same time, I'm checking for, ask him to raise his arm, for his. Uh, uh, when I'm also doing um, lymph node exam. Okay.